This video aims to explain the pathologies relating to traumatic anterior shoulder instability, also known as the traumatic unilateral dislocations with a Bankart lesion requiring surgery, TUBS in short. The primary goal of this video serves to introduce the anatomy of such pathologies and does not explain the physical examination or imaging for the diagnosis of these pathologies. Put simply, a traumatic anterior shoulder instability is trauma leading to the anterior dislocation of the humerus that can have associated pathologies, predisposing to a high recurrence of such dislocations and other consequences. Traumatic shoulder dislocations can take place anteriorly or posteriorly, with the anterior dislocation being much more common than the posterior dislocation, as the name implies. One of the reasons why anterior dislocations are much more common is because of the physiological position of the glenoid, which is naturally antiverted, meaning that the face is pointing anteriorly, which predisposes the humerus to slide in that direction. Although it is described as an anterior dislocation, it is not the only direction that the humerus moves towards. Under physiological circumstances, the humerus is held tightly against the glenoid due to the presence of many ligaments and rotator cuff muscles around the glenohumeral joint. These include the subscapularis and supraspinatus muscles that can be seen in the superior view, which act to press the humerus against the glenoid. Therefore, when a humeral head dislocates anteriorly past the glenoid rim, these structures will also pull on the humerus medially. Furthermore, the humerus also tends to move slightly inferiorly, simply due to the acromion forming a roof at the top, as well as simply due to the effect of gravity. One last note on the movement of the humerus during these dislocations. As the humerus moves anteriorly, there is a greater strain on the rotator cuff muscles located on the posterior side of the scapula, such as the supraspinatus in this example, and this creates a tendency for the humerus to undergo some external rotation as it moves forwards. It is important to understand the movement of the humerus during these dislocations because they are particularly relevant for how the pathologies are created. The shoulder and the hips are both bore and socket joints. However, the surface of the glenoid is relatively flat, unlike the acetabulum, and requires another structure called the glenoid labrum that lines the rim of the glenoid to help form a deeper socket to stabilize the humeral head. Amongst the many ligaments that help stabilize this glenohumeral joint, the glenohumeral ligaments are particularly relevant in the anterior dislocation of the shoulder, specifically the inferior glenohumeral ligament. The inferior glenohumeral ligament includes the anterior band and the posterior band, and it is the anterior band that is commonly involved in the anterior dislocation. Finally, let's move on to the pathologies that can result from these recurrent anterior dislocations. These can broadly be divided into soft tissue injuries as well as bony injuries. The most common soft tissue lesion is a Bankart lesion which is an evulsion of the anterior labrum as well as the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament from the glenoid. Sometimes the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament can be evolved from its attachment to the humerus rather than the glenoid. This is called a humeral evulsion of the glenohumeral ligament, which is Hagel for short. Next, there is the Alpsa lesion, which is the anterior labral periosteal sleeve evulsion where the periosteum of the anterior glenoid neck is also evolved along with the inferior glenohumeral ligament and the labrum, which can cause the labrum to be sandwiched in between the periosteum and the cortical bone underneath. The last soft tissue injury is a glenoid labral articular defect, also known as a GLAD lesion. This is where a portion of the articular cartilage of the glenoid is also evolved along with the labrum. Moving on to the bony lesions relating to the traumatic anterior shoulder dislocations, recall that when the humerus is dislocated anteriorly, it is also pulled medially. This creates a strong point of contact between the two bones. Also remember that the humerus tends to be externally rotated as it is dislocating anteriorly. Therefore, the site of contact is usually on the posterior lateral side of the humerus as well as the anterior part of the glenoid. The bony defect on the posterior lateral side of the humerus is referred to as a hill sex defect, whereas the bony defect on the anterior glenoid is referred to as a bony Bankart lesion, which is at the same site as a normal Bankart lesion. Finally, I will go on to describe the concepts relating to the on-track and off-track hill sex defects. The differentiation between these two types of hill sex defects depend on the size of the hill sex defect itself as well as 
the presence of any large bony Bankart lesion. In the case where both of these lesions are large, another recurring episode of this shoulder dislocation can cause the remaining part of the glenoid to be trapped, more professionally described as engaged, within the hill sex defect of the humerus. Under this circumstance, the hill sex defect is described as being off track. On the other hand, when the remains of the glenoid is larger than the size of the hill sex defect, this prevents the hill sex defect from engaging on the glenoid, which is described as a on-tracked hill sex defect.